Good morning. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the Latin American program here. John, can you help me a lot on the microphone? Is that okay? Here we go. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Latin American program. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning and certainly to welcome our distinguished panelists, um, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, the seminar this morning takes place in the context of a three-year research project based at the Latin American program, which explores um, the new left, the so-called new left and democratic governance in Latin America. An earlier stage of this project was devoted to the exploration of questions of human rights, um, political participation, and the relationship between the state and civil society. And there's a publication on one of the tables outside that includes the results of that phase of the inquiry. Um, the current phase of the project is aimed at understanding how and to what extent left governments in the region have translated uh, social demands for broader economic inclusion into social and fiscal policies um, conducive to growth and to reductions in poverty and inequality. In other words, if part of the explanation for the so-called rise of the left in Latin America owes to the widespread rejection of the results of market-based reforms of the Washington Consensus, what role have governments played in crafting policies to address poverty and, and inequality? What have been the results? Clearly, as I'm sure Santiago Levy will point out, new left governments are not alone in adopting novel approaches to reducing poverty and inequality in Latin America. Do the policies of left governments differ from those pursued by, by governments not considered to be leftist? And most importantly, are the policies sustainable over time? Last December, along with Flaxo Chile, we convened a conference in Santiago to discuss these questions. Um, Nora Lustig prepared the overview paper, which we are discussing today. Copies in English and Spanish are available on the table outside, and both will soon be available in bulletin form and on our website. The question of sustainability um, hovers over our discussion this morning. The impact of the global economic recession has been widespread throughout the world, and particularly in the region. The UN Economic Commission for, <clears throat> for Latin America and the, Ca and the Caribbean, known by the acronym CEPAL in Spanish, has published studies just la that last week indicating that regional GDP will contract by almost 2% this year. The region's exports have fallen 30% in value in 2009, remittances have plummeted, as have levels of foreign direct investment. More than three million people um, will lose their jobs. These are just the official figures. So we have a lot to discuss today. You have the bios of our panelists, um, and so I will only introduce them briefly, but I think we have truly a, um, a, a spectacular group of people with us this morning um, to discuss these issues. Um, Nora Lustig, who will speak first, um, will take up her position as the Samuel Z. Stone Professor of Latin American Economics at Tulane University starting in just a few weeks. Um, and she is also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global, De um, for Global Development. We are grateful to Nancy Birdsell and to Heather Haynes um, for their co-sponsorship of this event. Uh, Nora has um, taught at George Washington University, at the Universidad de las Américas in Puebla, Mexico and also at the Colegio de Mexico. She has worked for virtually every international organization that deals with questions of poverty and inequality and is truly one of the world's and region's leading experts on these questions. Santiago Levy also honors us with his presence. He is currently Vice President for Sector and Knowledge of um, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, previously, he held other senior positions at the IDB, including General Manager and Chief Economist uh, for the Research Department. Um, he has taught at the ITAM in Mexico and at Boston University and has written widely and is one of the leading experts um, on questions of poverty reduction and is also the architect of the program in Mexico that served as the model for um, conditional cash transfers. Um, Carolina Sanchez Paramo joins us from the World Bank um, as well as from Spain. Um, she is a labor economist by training and has done extensive work on 
on poverty and distribution, um, education, labor markets, and social protections, protection issues. Um, she has worked in other regions of the world, including Eastern Europe and South Asia, um, and just prior to um, joining the World Bank, she had received her PhD in economics from Harvard University. Um, we'll start with Nora. Again, welcome, and uh, we're delighted to have you all join us this morning. Point here. Oh, yeah. Where is it? Um, let's see. Adam, uh, let's see. If you go to <laughs> the PowerPoints, PowerPoints should be. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Ah, uh, 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 yeah, I can see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. <laughs> Usually we rely on the young people for these kinds of <laughs> indications. Right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming this morning. And uh, I want to start by thanking Cindy and uh, the uh, Wilson Center for inviting me to participate in this very, very interesting project. Actually, I was uh, working on income distribution and poverty issues from a very apolitical point of view for a long time. And she forced me to start to look at it also from the point of view of what can be the impact of having different political regimes, to which I am really grateful because now we started a research agenda uh, working on this uh, using more, increasingly more sophisticated approaches to try to establish whether there is a relationship between regime and the changes in poverty and inequality in the region. And I think that the uh, sort of general answer is that yes, we do find a relationship between regime and uh, what happens to poverty and inequality. But uh, I would like to sort of make uh, two uh, uh, comments to start before I start my presentation. We're looking at a sort of fairly short period of time. And in particular for the descriptive statistics, uh, we, you'll see we have very little uh, observations, very few observations, because you know, most of the left government started recently and the household surveys that you have to use to make this analysis are not necessarily available for those that uh, started uh, like two years ago. So we're going to have to be patient to see whether the results are robust as more, more and more uh, uh, data points come in from the household surveys. Secondly, I'm going to look at a trend that is not in, does not include the current crisis. I don't know what the current crisis will do. I know for sure that it will increase poverty, but I don't know what it will do to inequality yet uh, because this is a crisis that, of course, creates a lot of unemployment and therefore the poor uh, are going to lose. But also it's created a lot of wealth destruction, so the net effect we still don't know. If you look at uh, the Mary Lynch uh, uh, report on, on global wealth, it uh, records that uh, wealth has declined by about 25% last year as a result of the uh, stock market crash and other uh, things that affected wealth. And this is um, of the individuals of high net worth and of very high net worth. However, they point out that Latin America is one of the regions where the losses have been the smallest compared to other regions of the world. But we'll see. So anyway, uh, the, the third thing that I also wanted to mention is that the household surveys have many problems. I'm not going to go into that. That's the data, point, uh, data sources that we use for any of these uh, analysis. But uh, one of the main problems is they don't really capture the very rich. So the Carlos Slims and people like that are not really reflected in what happens in the household surveys. And therefore, when we look at what happens to the evolution of inequality, we have to bear that in mind. In order to be able to analyze what happens to the top income distribution, we need data that most of the countries do not make readily available because it comes from the tax returns. Uh, and uh, there's been a resistance for reasons that we probably know <laughs> why to actually share that kind of data, although most, I mean, all of the OECD countries are releasing it, except for Mexico, for example, which is an OECD member. If we had access to that data, we would be able to know more what's happening at the top of the income distribution. So one of the things that I think we need to push is that transparency. Uh, in order to have access to data at the higher end of the distributive um, 
uh, of the distribution. Okay, uh, I mean, let me just share a fact that everybody knows that if you take you know, any inequality measure here, I use the Gini coefficient, Latin America continues to be the most unequal region of the world. Uh, and here you have, you know, that uh, sort of it's still more unequal than sub-Saharan Africa, despite that with that data we know that sub-Saharan Africa also has very individual countries that are highly unequal, much more unequal than East Asia, and uh, mm, definitely much more unequal than the developed countries. However, since the year, uh, since 2000 approximately, there's been a trend of falling inequality in Latin America, which is quite pervasive. Here you see, you know, this is a sample of 17 countries. We do not include Colombia because it has the most horrible surveys in terms of comparability. Not maybe each one individually is very good, but if you want to track over time for Colombia, you can't. And you can see that uh, there's 12 countries for which inequality fell, and there's only one for which this, uh, the striped bars refer to the changes that are not statistically significant if you compare the two points in time, but for all the others, the changes are. So on average, Latin America has been seeing uh, like a 1.1% per year decline in, in the Gini coefficient. If you use other uh, indicators, the results vary little, but it's quite a remarkable change. And we're working on a separate uh, project with the UNDP to look at what are the drivers behind this falling inequality, and we're finding interesting things that I'll comment briefly at the end. So in addition to inequality falling, extreme poverty has declined more rapidly than before. And these trends do coincide with the uh, growing number of countries that are governed by the left. Uh, this year, we have 10 countries that are being governed by the left. And in terms of population, there's two thirds of Latin America that is living under a leftist government, which is unheard of, I think, in, in, in history, in the history of Latin America. Here you have the countries and the years uh, in which the new left government took power in each one of them. Among the left, the Wilsons, and by the way, I take totally, totally the definition of le new left and uh, the division between social democratic and populist left regimes from the Wilson Center. I'm not a political scientist, so I just take that as an exogenous variable for my <laughs> research. But uh, so if you have any questions about that, I think you should direct them to, to Cindy. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, they distinguish between the social democratic left regimes and the populist left regimes. Uh, and they think, I think you still have to classify Paraguay and El Salvador, uh, which were not classified in this original, you know, original uh, study. That, uh, but, you know, they, they follow a definition that's more linked to what happens in the political dimension. But I think that, you know, it mimics pretty much the way economists would distinguish between the two groups because I think economists will focus more on what happens on macroeconomic policy. Are the countries engaging in fiscal expansionary policies that may not be sustainable over time? And also, I think a very important aspect of the more populist regimes is that they tend to be more, if you want, aggressive regarding how they treat uh, the uh, sort of san sanctity of private property. Whereas the social democratic governments tend to be much more fiscally prudent and much less inclined to try to sort of antagonize whoever holds property. And I think that is pretty much the case. So the political and the economic definition may actually lead to the same classification, I would say. So the main question here is do the trends in poverty differ in countries that are governed by the left? And what I did is compare to previous governments, immediately previous ones, that were non-leftists, and also with contemporary governments that are not classified as leftists. And I say the answer is in general yes, both using the descriptive statistics, and now I'm going to bring in something that is not in the paper that uh, was attributed, some new work I'm doing with Darren McLeod from Fordham University, using some econometric analysis. So uh, the sample of countries are, are 17, because we, uh, we dropped uh, Colombia for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, and we divide them into three groups, the social democratic group, the populist left, and the non-left and all the others. Why didn't we include these countries among the left, Bolivia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Paraguay? It's because, you know, I assume that in order to see whether leftist governments are making a difference, I need to begin to observe 
the trends in inequality and poverty at least a year after they've been in power. Otherwise, I probably would be looking at what the previous ones did. And this is an arbitrary selection because, you know, people could argue, and I will actually at the end, that some of what's happening is not a result of what the current governments are doing, but also reaping benefits of things that happened in the past. Uh, and for these countries, we did not have data points, or we only had one, so I could not compare what was the evolution if I have only one data point. So stay tuned, <coughs> because the more the surveys come out, the more we're going to be able to actually uh, deepen into the uh, sample and get more uh, robust results. The two indicators in the descriptive statistics analysis that I use is the frequency at which inequality and poverty declined, the number of countries in, of the total uh, in each one of the groups, and the rate at which poverty and inequality decline. We use here the SEDLAC, which is uh, a different database than people usually use, which is uh, the CEPAL database, because I could have access directly to the micro data working together with uh, the center in La Plata. But we checked for the robustness of the results if we would have used CEPAL data, and they don't change. So that, uh, that's important for me to point out, because people ask me why did I use uh, and unusual if you want said. Uh, okay, what are the results? I think there are three conclusions. First, when we compare to the past, in a country that's now governed by a leftist uh, uh, regime, the poverty and inequality either began to decline compared to the past, before it probably did not decline or it even increased in the immediate past, uh, than under previous regimes. But we will see in Venezuela that's not the case. And it's sort of interesting also because Venezuela is a country that has had a leftist government, a populist left, for the longest compared to all the others. It's the one that's been there for longer. Here we will see in a, in a little bit that uh, the uh, changes were very volatile and following pretty much the economic cycle. So Venezuela ends up more or less where it started now uh, if you look at uh, the poverty and inequality indicators. The second one is that, you know, for the only period, and this is, you know, a very uh, sort of restrictive period because I can only look at uh, what happened during three or four years uh, because that's when I have most countries already under the leftist regime that have data because that's my other restriction. Uh, so the reductions in inequality as well as in poverty and extreme poverty occurred with greater frequency in leftist than in leftist countries. So if you group them, you see that the uh, ratio is higher. And third, the inequality and poverty decline at rates that can be twice or three times faster or more in the case of extreme poverty in countries governed by the left. And within the countries governed by the left, the speed at which the decline occurred was faster among the populists than among the social democrats. And here, you know, there is, you can see this is the Gini coefficient. Just a reminder, the Gini is measured between 0 and 1, or 0 in, or, and 100 if you use it in percent. The closer it is to 1, the more unequal the country is. The closer it is to 0, the less unequal. But here I have rates of change. And so I have the two populists, the social democratic, and the non-left. And the uh, populists uh, have experience a faster decline in, uh, in, in inequality than, uh, than the other, than the social democratic, and definitely when you combine them, if you keep Uruguay, which is the outlier, the decline among the left is about twice as much as that of the non-left. If you exclude Uruguay, it is almost three times as fast. And remember that all these changes except for one here, which uh, then would switch the, uh, the results even further, all these changes were statistically significant, and that's important uh, to, to underscore. Uh, extreme poverty fell by much faster uh, in the populace on average than in the, uh, the non-left, and the same thing for social democrats. If you take out Uruguay, I take out Uruguay also because it seems to have such wide changes, and that happens because Uruguay has relatively lower inequality, and very little extreme poverty. So any change looks very big when you take a percentage. So when you take it out, you still see that, you know, for example, extreme poverty for the social democratic left increased, uh, decreased, I'm sorry, by multiples of what happened to the non-left, which is the last, I don't know why my 
pointer. It's a minus 4.6 here. And for the uh, populist left, it was much bigger even. It was like almost five times, around five times faster. Okay. So it looks like if you just would focus on the descriptive statistics of this period, you could say, yes, the left is doing better. And within the left, the populists are doing better than the social democrats, which has made very, lots of people nervous <laughs> uh, for reasons that we can discuss later. But uh, I want to mention three caveats. First, the results are really looking at a limited set of countries even within the left. And as you uh, add countries, I don't know whether the descriptive statistics will continue to show this. Probably not. And second, it's for a very short period of time. So we can't make inferences as you know, something this is a big, big result because it may be just a statistical uh, sort of coincidence. The second thing that's important is that we are looking at simultaneity, but I'm not attributing causality because I don't know whether other things happen during the period that may be explaining why inequality and poverty fell in these countries. So we have to watch out and not say, okay, you know, I find this, so this is a result that uh, shows that the uh, leftist governments are better at reducing poverty and inequality. Thirdly, even if populist regimes are proven to be more redistributive, even if we find that statistically, et cetera, we still want to ask the question, are the policies sustainable? Maybe they're implementing things that work for two, three years, but then you know, they face a fiscal um, crisis or uh, <clears throat> a growth crisis because what they did actually spooked out investors, and therefore this would not be sustainable. So let me uh, address this um, using, this is what, uh, what's not in the paper, and these are the new results from the econometric analysis. Uh, you know, what happens if we control for the boom in commodity prices? Because clearly this coincides with the period in which many of these countries were enjoying very high rates of growth. And this great rate of growth was associated to the boom in commodity prices that started in 2002. And also what happens if we control for other factors that are invariant across countries that could be the average quality of education or could be the share of indigenous population, which in econometric jargon is called the fixed effects. So we, we've been doing that. And uh, so we did this with a regression analysis of a panel of 17 countries for a 20 year period. So now we feel we have you know, more observations in which we can actually begin to test some of the uh, questions. And the results do uh, suggest that political regime affects inequality and poverty outcomes. I'm not going to, the table is there just to show that it exists, but uh, let me, let me uh, sort of tell you what is it that we find. Well, the first thing that's interesting and perhaps not surprising is that public spending is not progressive. It, doesn't, it actually increases inequality in uh, Latin America. I'm focusing now on inequality because I think the most interesting thing is to see what happens to inequality. We all know that when uh, you know, countries grow, poverty will fall, but inequality can go in either direction. So what happens to inequality? Well, the first thing is that we find, as uh, perhaps it's not surprising to many, that public spending in Latin America is not progressive. In, distributed, in the distributive sense. Uh, and when we you know, sort of isolate the, uh, econometrically the sort of type of regime, we find that the sort of difference of having social democratic and populist regimes would make it more progressive. So we do find a significance in that sense. But the inequality reducing impact of public spending in the populist regimes of Argentina, we added Bolivia because we could add Bolivia for the regressions and Venezuela disappears, and I mean that econometrically, the variable, the coefficient is no longer significant in the statistical sense if one controls for the commodity price boom and the, uh, the fixed effects. So what seems to be happening, particularly in Argentina and Venezuela, is a reversion to what the type of inequality they used to have. These two countries, particularly Argentina, had a systematic increase of inequality in the 90s, and then after 2002, this inequality was reversed. Both Venezuela and Argentina have the lowest indices of inequality in the region, so there seems to be a reversal to the normal level of inequality existing in these countries more than a fundamental change, if you want. 
But, you know, we could still say that to the credit of uh, the regimes, they're doing it because others could have just not implement policies that, that would reverse the, the inequality to the, to the levels that existed before. And here, you know, you can see it, uh, uh, you know, graphically. The green bars, I don't know if you see them as green or dark green, are the left, when the leftists, the populist left took power, and the brown lines, or red, dark red, refer to the uh, years before. So what you see is that throughout the 90s, inequality systematically rose. By the way, in the case of Argentina, it is for urban areas only, but they account for close to 80% of the population, so it's taken as an indication of what happens to inequality more or less throughout. And after the left takes power, then inequality goes back to the levels that used to exist before you had the surge in the increases in inequality. And now, you know, we have a paper uh, by Gasparini and others that have looked at the entire period, actually going back to the 70s, of what is behind this. So I can, you know, if you have questions, we can go into that. In the case of Venezuela, what you can see is that, you know, it's the volatility. Inequality kind of moves with the, with the economic cycle. And, you know, in Venezuela used to be a more equal countries, a more equal country in the, in the early 90s, and it had an increase, and then, you know, the increase continued, and then there was a fall at the beginning of the uh, Chavez administration, but then you had the crisis in Venezuela, it went up again, they were fall, then again it went up. So it's very volatile. And the trend seems to be that perhaps, if you look at, you know, from, from here to here, what's happening is that Venezuela is moving in the direction of what it used to have in terms of inequality. So it's a reversion to its normal inequality levels. In contrast, you know, because, so then what we're saying is that there hasn't been anything special that was done by the populist regimes in terms of the use of the commodity boom. They're using the boom to go back to what type of inequality they had before. In the case of the social democratic governments, particularly in the case of Chile and Brazil, perhaps we do see a break from the past. These two countries tended to be highly unequal and on a very sustainable basis over time. They had genies, in the case of Brazil, sometimes above 0.6, which are among the highest in the world. In the case of Chile, around 0 0.55, 0 0.54, which is also very high. So the evidence seems to be more conclusive. Even when you control for the commodity price boom, inequality fell faster in the social democratic regimes where public spending in particular begins to reduce inequality. So you do see that maybe there is where the regime makes a difference, if you want, in terms of what kind of policies were implemented to deal with the uh, issues of, of uh, economic inequality. And here you can see you know, that Brazil had, and if you go back, you know, the inequality is very resiliently high. I have a graph that goes all the way down to the 1970s. And here it begins to fall. And again, this fall is statistically significant, okay? The case of Chile also, I mean, everybody said, well, Chile has had this progressive government for such a long time, and people wonder, why is, it in a, why is inequality such a hard thing to see fall in, in a country like Chile that has implemented so many innovative uh, social policies? Well, it turns out that when the uh, leftist part of the coalition took power, inequality began to fall. Uh, so again, and this is a statistical different, uh, significant change. So let me give you some further thoughts. Some people, and in the World Bank actually, have been talking about inequality convergence in Latin America, saying you know, that low inequality countries are going, moving in the direction of higher, high inequality countries are moving in the direction of low. Well, these results seem to indicate that we're not seeing a convergence, that for the traditionally in, Low inequality countries, maybe we're going back to low inequality levels, comparatively speaking, within Latin America, not you know, comparative to the world. And some of the high inequality countries are beginning to experience a decline in inequality. And at the end, I'm going to say whether this is new or not, I mean, whether this could be sustained or not. So what have been the main driver, and this comes from the other project, that, you know, by the way, we see, like I said initially, we see this decline in inequality in many countries of the region. Uh, 12 out of uh, the 17 show this decline in inequality in the graph that I uh, showed at the beginning uh, of the presentation. 
And this is work that I'm doing with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva from the Bureau of Latin America at, uh, in New York. Uh, so one of the things that we are observing is that there's been a reduction in the skilled and skilled wage gap, which is new to the region because for the entire 90s, for practically every country, you saw things moving in the opposite direction. Uh, in economist jargon, what you're seeing is that uh, the returns to ed education are becoming less convex when that was not the case in the past. The other thing that we see is a more equal distribution of educational attainment. Uh, so that's actually a very interesting change as well. And also, we're seeing that in many of the countries, a larger share of public spending is going to the poor. It is a change in the margin. There's a lot of spending that's still not progressive, but some things are making it less unprogressive than in the past. And to a lesser extent, we see also demographic changes that are moving in the direction of favoring uh, more in, uh, a reduction in inequality because the family size and the working adults per household are uh, moving in the right direction. Family size is falling, but more so for the poor, and the number of working adults per household is rising, particularly among the poor. So you do have what is, you know, the former is a result of reduction in fertility, the latter is the consequences of a higher participation of women in the labor force for paid jobs. That is inequality reducing, because in most cases this is happening at the, at the bottom. So what is, uh, you know, of all this process, maybe the result of past policies and what's new? Well, in the case here of the uh, two of the uh, social democratic countries that we're looking at, in Brazil and Chile, we can say that it's this is sort of a narrowing of the skilled and skilled wage gap and the improvement in the distribution, by improvement I mean more equal distribution of educational attainment, is a result of policies that have been emphasizing the expansion of coverage of basic education that has taken place for more than a decade. There were some pushes, uh, I mean in the case of Mexico, which we find the same result, they started in the early 90s, for example. In the case of uh, Brazil, the, it started under the Cardoso regime, it was probably you know, emphasized by the Lula regime, but it's something that started. In Chile, actually, the results show that even the, the uh, voucher system and things that it implemented uh, increased the access to higher education for uh, many people that did not have it before. Uh, so this is you know, part of past policies. Under the new left, I think what, what's new is that more fiscal resources are devoted to transfers to the poor uh, than before. And also, uh, there's been programs that expand school enrollment for poor children in basic education, the conditional cash transfers, or the Chile Solidario that's emphasizing you know, the, what happens in the family. Uh, and yeah, I mean, probably Santiago will say, but this is not unique to the left. No, I mean, Mexico has done this too. But uh, among the non-left, uh, Mexico is pretty uh, unique so far. I mean, may maybe there will be more in the future. I can see that some of the, it happening also in Peru. Uh, but uh, um, I don't know if I, we have time in the discussion. I can bring this in. So what's happening with more fiscal resources devoted to transfers to the poor uh, under the new left? In the case of Brazil, which I have looked at very carefully, what's happened is that the government has well, I mean, one of the things that explains a decline in inequality in addition to the narrowing of the wage gap is a non-labor income, which includes transfers, and in the case of Brazil, 80% of the non-labor income is transfers. But remember, the very rich are not in the household surveys. Well, that has become less unequal, and it has become less unequal for two reasons. One, there has been an expansion of some of the benefits, and second, there's been a very big expansion of the coverage of some of the programs, in particular Bolsa Familia, which did not increase so much the size of the benefit, but has included an increasing number of people under the Lula government. So Bolsa Familia and the, um, the other program that's called BCP, which is the uh, pension to the elderly, have, according to uh, Barros, uh, Ricardo Barros, they explain about 10% of the decline each, of the decline in inequality observed in Brazil. 
So redistribution has been effective. He still finds that there's a lot of things that the government is not doing well if it wants to use the fiscal instrument to redistribute big time, as it happens in more advanced countries. But the changes have been, in some sense, in some cases, moving in the right direction. In the case of, uh, and also you know, the fact that Bolsa Familia is linked to the school enrollment, is expanding the coverage of the uh, students of lower income groups, which also then becomes uh, makes the you know, fiscal spending on education more pro poor. In the case of Argentina, which is on the populist side, we see more sort of a change that is linked to uh, policies that affect, yes, the transfers through particularly the jefes and jefas uh, program that has been transferring income to uh, households that where, where, where one of the members is unemployed. Uh, despite all its problems, the program has reduced poverty and was cushioning uh, during the crisis and exposed. But secondly, in Argentina, what you see is the use of much more active labor market policies in the sense that there has been a very sharp increase in the minimum wage. But by the way, that happened also in Brazil, but also mandated wage increases and changes also in the support of certain bargaining schemes of uh, the union. So the political economy in the case of Argentina, worked in the direction of making the distribution perhaps going back to the greater equality in the past. But if you look at Argentina and Venezuela, there are two problems. One is that uh, there's Vito, who's been probably studying this with a magnifying glass. They've been expanding their uh, fiscal spending very rapidly during the boom years, and now uh, Venezuela has to undergo a very sharp adjustment because with oil prices falling, they can maintain that. And the same goes uh, for Argentina. They are running policies that are unsustainable and they have to, you know, as they always did under populist regime, they're gonna follow what happens to the economic cycle. And secondly, they have adopted policies that are alienating the private sector. So investment, private investment, in Argentina and Venezuela have been very small. I mean, the, the growth rate has been declining uh, quite uh, rapidly. So the policies that are being implemented there are probably at the expense of macroeconomic stability and uh, growth in the future, and so may not be sustainable. And this is, you know, right now it's more conjectural, uh, a, a conjectural proposition, but from what we learned from the past, we would not be surprised if that's the case. So to conclude, I think that uh, what we do see is, first, that there is a relationship between the political regime and the outcomes uh, in terms of income inequality and, and poverty. Second, that some of these may be, in the case of the populist re regimes, the result of the governments making use of the advantages of the commodity boom but not necessarily going the extra mile to change the uh, sort of structurally their policies in a way to make them sustainable and, and pro poor. And in the case of the social democratic regimes, we're seeing the combination of policies that maintain fiscal stability and also the incentives to the private sector and at the same time are beginning to move in the direction of making public spending more progressive. However, in these two cases, particularly in the case of Brazil that has been uh, analyzed uh, very carefully by, by uh, Pais de Barros and his colleagues, we do find that the instrument, some of the instruments that are still being used by the government are not you know, the most progressive ones, and that there's still lots of room for improvement, but things have been moving in the right direction. So thank you. Uh, looking forward to it. Well, thank you very much for that extremely comprehensive um, discussion. Um, Santiago, either sitting there or at the podium. Whichever it's all right. Prefer. It's yeah, right yeah. there is fine. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, l let me begin by thanking the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Center for Global Development for inviting me to be here in this talk this morning. Um, so, so I think Nora asks a very, really interesting question. Um, is it the case that the new left countries in Latin America have more, quote unquote, progressive social policies that are reducing inequality and reducing poverty more 
than other countries in Latin America that are not, quote unquote, new left? Um, it is a really interesting question. Uh, Nora hinted, you know, there's obvious political implications in terms of the way you see the answer to that question, and um, it, it is very substantive in terms of for Latin America. Nora makes a very good effort, and with the data available, I think there's really nothing else that she could have done um, to try to answer that question, given the limitations of how many countries do have an income expenditure survey, how many points do you have in that income expenditure survey, and what is the coverage of the income expenditure survey, which is the basic tool that you use um, to try to answer these kind of questions. Um, so, so I'll differ a little bit from Nora in saying that, in, in my view, the question can't be answered. Um, the question can be answered. Um, I'm not convinced by the fact that the different changes in the rates of decline, very marginal really, statistically significant but still very marginal, um, in, in, the, in the Gini coefficients in one set of countries versus another set of countries, is, is sufficient to really say, look, the new left regimes um, are having more progressive social policies and they're doing better at reducing poverty and inequality than the other countries in Latin America. Um, I, and I think so for two reasons. I think so first because the data is not good enough to answer that question, but perhaps more importantly, because I think it's too early to answer that question. It's just too early. And, and I'll come back and, and I'll say why. But first, um, a little bit of, of, of an issue of data and, and classification of countries. So I know Nora mentioned, and, and this is maybe, maybe the Woodrow Wilson Center's fault, that they classify countries between left, right, and within the left, we now make a division between the new left, which is populist, and the new left, which is social democratic. And that might be a very useful characterization of countries from the point of view of the political orientation and many other dynamics. I'm not really so sure that that's from the point of view of specific social policies, a, a, a good cut. Because if you really ask yourself the question, let me rank countries by the policy instruments that they have used to try to improve income distribution and reduce poverty, and let me rank countries by the sources of revenue that they have used to finance those programs, you get a different ranking. And so if you're really thinking about, well, the really interesting lesson about the new left countries is that the policies that they're implementing are useful policies and there's something to be learned for other countries, um, then my, my point would be it's more important to look at the actual policies that are being implemented that are the label that is being placed on the particular country that, that puts on it. And I argue that two central characteristics of the policies are exactly what are the instruments that are being used, you know, and what are the incentives associated with those instruments, and equally importantly, how are those programs and, and all that social spending being paid for? So you could argue that, in fact, Mexico is more, in some sense, left than Brazil, because even though they both have a very similar program in terms of fighting poverty, a conditional cash transfer program, a, a, you know, progress in one case, both of family in the other case, um, Brazil has actually paid for its program with a much bigger effort at raising its own revenues from taxation and from other sources of reaccommodation of public spending, whereas Mexico, in my view, by and large, has paid for it uh, taking advantage of a large oil boom and, and, and there's less redistribution going on in Mexico that probably the amount of redistribution that is going on in Brazil. Um, but from that perspective, Mexico is perhaps being closer to other leftist countries that are financing this with an oil, you know, with a, with a commodity boom as opposed to other sources of income. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, is, is it is really much more important to map countries in terms of the set of policies that they're using to try to redistribute income rather than other labels that might be useful for other kinds of political characterizations rather than from the actual characterization of policy they're implementing. Then the data really is, 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 is and this is not not as fault at all, this is, a, you know, that's the data there is, um, doesn't really allow you to capture a lot of the efforts that the governments are making. And I was surprised in Nora's paper, if you look at Venezuela, for instance, Venezuela doesn't show that much um, improvement compared to, say, Argentina. But I think it might partly be a fault of the data because a lot of the redistribution in, our, in Venezuela goes on through in-kind programs 
um, these missiones and stuff like that, which are difficult to pick up in income expenditure surveys as opposed to the conditional cash transfers programs that given the fact that they're money, monetary transfers and they, they show up in the household statistics as actual income, whereas the other kinds of programs don't show up in the household statistics. So, so it's difficult then to say, you know, trying to be more fair to Venezuela, maybe there is a larger effort there that it's not being picked up, but because the government decided that most of its effort was going to be done through in-kind programs as opposed to the effort being done through, through monetary programs. So because of that, I think that the data is not sufficient to really make the point. The underlying policies don't map into the classification of countries between left, right, and uh, social democratic and populist. And I'll, a point I'll come back in a minute, because it's too early to tell. I, I don't think we're still at the point in which you can make the general statement, yes, it is true that over the last seven years, experience shows that new left countries in Latin America are, from the social point of view, performing better than what they're doing in other countries. Um, my reading of it is, is that for Latin America as a whole, the past eight years, and Nora very carefully, and, and I agree with her, her, her um, distinction, stops in 2008 because the picture from 2009 onwards is going to be a very difficult pic picture. Um, but you could say, look, the, the general shift towards democracy in Latin America has been associated with a reduction of inequality and a reduction in poverty. Secondly, it is also the case that the period that we're looking at between 2002 and 2008, more or less, is an unusually favorable period from the point of view of Latin America. So Latin America benefited from very high world commodity prices, benefited from unusual access to international credit, benefited from unusual growth in the world economy, so they were, you know, really, truly unusually favorable in circumstances, and this is important to point out because this drastically changes from 2009 onwards, or by the end of 2008 onwards. So you have a period in which, first, democracy is improving in, in most countries. There's, you know, right and left. There's a big pressure on governments to increase social spending. This is feasible because macroeconomic management improves a little bit. World conditions are very favorable, and why not? there's also some better programs that are being implemented in the past, particularly programs that, as opposed to the generation of social programs that were in the 80s and perhaps early 90s, target benefits much better. And because these programs target benefits much better, you get a lot more mile for your buck. You get a lot of mileage for the amount of uh, effort that is being made. And to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, I know these numbers from Mexico, so, but I'm sure for the countries are not that distinct. So the lowest two decils of the population in Mexico takes before transfers somewhere between 2 to 2.5% of GDP. So it's a very skewed distribution of income. So then you have a transfer program that redistributes half a percent of GDP. Now, to redistribute half a percent of GDP, is, which is a cost of progresa, is really not that much of a redistributive effort. But half a percent of GDP for the first two decils of the distribution that are receiving 2, 2.5% two of GDP is a 20% increase in income. So with very little real redistributive effort, you get a lot of redistribution going on. And I think that, you know, um, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, which is also, you know, you probably would label as right, Colombia and many other countries in Union and Central America did this and are taking advantage of something that is very sad, but from the perspective of these programs, very useful that the, the Distribution is very skewed, and therefore, with very little effort, you can go very far. So you can have a general reading that says, that's why you reduce poverty. And as a byproduct of that reduction in poverty, inequality indices increased because, again, you were increasing income at the lower end of the distribution, and the Gini picks up the fact that in the first two decils, these income transfers are improving income. And the income transfers, and the you know, reductions in the Gini are you know, important, not to mention correctly, statistically significant, but, but not that large. So you can have an alternative view which says, look, the label right, left, populist, social democrat really is, is perhaps not the best way to think about it. The best way to think is the, tra the transition to democracy in Latin America put greater pressures on Latin American countries right and left, Colombia and Mexico, as well as Brazil and Venezuela, to increase social spending, 
This could be done because world international conditions were much better, macroeconomic management was better, and the programs that were being implemented to carry this out were better programs than in the past. And that would be sort of my reading. Uh, under that reading, the really interesting questions, and that's where maybe right and left, uh, and the econometric results that Nora mentions in the second part of her paper um, are important, are two questions. Sustainability of these policies, and we have to ask ourselves the question, are these set of policies that were viable when the world was growing and you know, commodity prices were high and people had access to international capital markets and whatnot, are these set of policies viable in, in the current context? So the issue of fiscal sustainability comes to the forefront. The issue of fiscal sustainability becomes very, very important. And um, that's why I say it's too early to tell. Let's talk in 2012, 2013, after the cycle is over and, the, and the things come back up, and then ask ourselves the question exactly what has happened in terms of the effort that it's been countries are being done. Um, I myself think that the redistribution that is being occurring through these programs is less than what is said. Uh, there's a lot of redistribution from the future to the present. There's not that much redistribution from high-income households to low-income households. And that redistribution from the future to the present has to do with taking advantage of a natural resource that might be depletable or a high commodity price or some you know, particular cycle. So that's one point. The second point that I want to make about this, this, this set of policies and programs that have been put in place is I think a substantially underestimated effect of these programs has to do with the impact on incentives. In my view, neither the new left countries nor the right countries have really constructed social programs that are well aligned in terms of incentives of firms and workers to increase productivity. I think a major issue that Latin American social policy has to face is that many of these programs, yes, do increase households' incomes fairly fast. Some have the right incentives for people to go to school, for people to go to health clinics <coughs> and to invest in their human capital, but many others of the programs, uh, Nora mentioned Jefas y Jefes in Argentina, I can mention so many other programs in Mexico and I could say the same for Colombia, which are not the conditional cash transfer programs, but are programs for workers, many of them in the informal sector, but are part of the subset of government spending that has occurred in the last few years, really, in my view, don't really have sufficient incentives for workers and firms to move in the direction of higher productivity, more labor training, more investment into the future, more adoption of technology. Uh, in my view, many of these programs, what they're doing is they're subsidizing informality, fostering informality, and actually punishing productivity. And if you look at the question, at the data for productivity for the region, it's really not very promising. So the sustainability question of these social policies really has two dimensions. Has the fiscal sustainability dimension and has the productivity dimension, asking yourself the question, are these societies constructing sufficiently well-trained workers such that in the future they will be more productive than in the past and they don't have to live forever on transfers? And this is, of course, a generalization, but the answer to that question is, on the whole, no. And on the fiscal side, the answer is very heterogeneous. Nora showed some very important results at the end in which in the social democratic new left, Yes, you know, there's an effort to pay for all this with some internal adjustments of public spending or taxes, but in the other is, you know, plus échange, plus la même chose. You know, we've seen this picture before in terms of, of you know, just distributing a temporary uh, price boom. Another point I want to make about these policies is that none of these social policies that are there are really correcting from the underlying inequality that occurs at the very, very top of the distribution. And as Nora said, this is not even picked up by the data. But we know, you know, because the distribution of, 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 of rents and, and power is, is extremely unequal in the region, and the first slide that Nora showed speaks for itself. Um, because at the end, these programs and policies cannot correct for that. But an important component of the inequality in Latin America has to do with the fact that you still have large groups of people, or you know, important groups of people with large amount of economic power associated with rents. <laughs> 
in the pure old sense of monopoly rents, olig oligopoly rent, you know, special concessions, special privilege, and this and that, you know, some business people, and also, as well, some unions that occupy particularly privileged positions, and none of these policies are tackling that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you ask yourself the question, can you correct the underlying inequality in the distribution of, of wealth and, sort of, and rent and all that through these sort of programs and policies, the answer to that is no. Um, so to look forward a little bit, um, 2008, last trimester, the world changes. From the point of view of Latin America, it changes for the worse. Um, the good news so far is that countries, by and large, because of the prudent macro policy in the past, are hanging on. But clearly, as Nora rightly points out, this is going to have a negative impact on the indicators for poverty and inequality. Because in a way, the sort of social policies that the countries have put in place don't really are modern in the sense of having like unemployment insurance and, 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 and properly constructed you know, protection against social risks as opposed to mechanisms for transferring income. And that construction of instruments for the protection against social risk, particularly output shocks and unemployment shocks, is not there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is going to put the, the, the region in, in a difficult situation. Um, I think we're at the end of what CCTs could do. I am actually beginning to be of the opinion that CCTs are being abused, and you're trying to correct something for which these programs were not designed to correct. These programs were designed to invest in the human capital of the poor as a byproduct to transitorily increase their present consumption. But you can't fight inequality and poverty by transfers alone and by distorting incentives, which is what's at the edge of beginning to happen in the region. So I end there by asking, what is new about the new left? Um, so to answer the question is, has underlying structural changes in the economy, in the design of social policies, the way they affect incentives to firms and workers, in the way the dynamics of productivity takes place, and the dynamics of rents generating in the societies, have this changed under the new left? I'll leave the question open. I think the answer is probably not positive. And then I ask I one last point, and I close here. Is that different? in the right countries of Latin America? And I think that the question, again, probably cannot be answered in the positive. So I stop here. Thank you. Carolina, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, to the center and to Cindy for having me. Uh, it's really an honor to share the table with Nora and with Santiago and to be able to comment on this paper. Uh, I feel like I should be really sitting there rather than here, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, I guess the advantage of coming last is that you have plenty of time to absorb the information, think through it, and learn. The disadvantage is that then there's a challenge of you know, what to say after Nora has spoken and Santiago has spoken. So what you will see is that actually a lot of the things that I have to say coincide with some of the comments that Santiago made. Um, I'm going to bring some data uh, in, in my presentation, which I think underscores some of his points. Uh, so hopefully this will be complementary uh, in terms of the later discussion. Just a very brief overview of what I took away from Nora's paper. Um, I agree with Santiago that this is a very interesting question. I sort of looked at it broadly as trying to address the issue of, you know, what's the role that policy and institutions play vis-a-vis -vis poverty and inequality reduction when compared to sort of more aggregate factors like growth, et cetera. And then you can obviously narrow that question and sort of start thinking about the ideology of a particular government and where that would steer this government in terms of policy and linking that to uh, poverty and inequality. As Nora argues, this question can be looked at in two ways. I mean, you could think about why these governments get elected in the first case. 
Uh, so you sort of look at the inequality and the poverty and then try to understand what happens in the political arena, or you can do it the other way around. You can take their ideology as given and then see what happens with poverty and inequality, and it's this second sort of take that the paper pursues. Um, it focuses on changes, you know, on frequency and magnitude of the changes, and the conclusion, as Nora described, is that there seems to be some relationship between the ideology of the government and the changes that we've observed over time. What I'm going to try to do in my comments is it's a couple of things. Um, the first set of comments are going to look at the question, and you know, I fully agree with the caveats that Santiago mentioned. The period is short. Uh, there are data limitations. It is a challenging question to tackle at this point, given what we've, what we've seen and what may happen over the next few years, but let's take that sort of as a given for the time being. And I would like to sort of think about this question and maybe suggest a couple of alternative ways of phrasing the question and trying to answer it. Um, and I think these ways kind of shed a little bit more light uh, on the answer. And I think Nora is trying to pursue that avenue, at least from what I saw uh, with the regression analysis and so on. And then in the second part of my comments, I would like to sort of go back of this issue of what's really happening in the region in terms of poverty reduction uh, beyond sort of the particular political sign of, of governments here and there. And I think some of these points uh, coincide with points that Santiago already made, uh, but I'll bring some numbers to bear. Um, the paper present, that Nora presented, as I said, basically shows that there's some correlation uh, between poverty and inequality changes. They appear to be more frequent and larger in countries that are governed by what's called the left. Um, and this conclusion is reached by comparing these governments to governments that to governments in the same countries right before. So a time comparison within countries or to contemporaneous governments that are non-leftist uh, and that are in power right now. So sort of contemporaneous spatial comparison. What I would like to suggest is that we think about this question in a slightly different way, or we phrase the question in a slightly different way. That is, if we think about what's happening in the region in terms of growth, and as was already commented by both Nora and Santiago, the last few years have been remarkable in terms of economic growth in the region, and in terms of the confluency of a series of factors that have made that growth sort of sustainable, robust, et cetera. There are issues of sustainability that we can think about later, but you know, pretty unusual period in terms of economic growth. If we think about that, I think the question to really ask is, do we see governments in the left managing to decrease poverty and inequality beyond what would have been predicted by this economic growth? So basically meaning, since countries are doing well, we would, in any case, expect poverty to be going down. Inequality is slightly more difficult because the evidence relating economic growth to inequality, it's more mixed. But in the case of poverty, there is a very clear relationship between positive economic growth and poverty declines. So given that we would expect to see that relationship, is this relationship somehow stronger in those places where the left is in government? Meaning, are they getting more poverty reduction for a given you know, amount of economic growth? Another way of looking at this is saying, okay, well, let's take the economic growth as given, <laughs> and let's try to imagine a scenario where, say, in a country like Brazil, we had a right sort of wing government as opposed to a left wing government. Would things have looked differently? Um, so it's just a way of tackling the same question, but maybe framing it a slightly different. And let me show you a few numbers that try to look at things from this angle and what those show. What I've done here is I've taken some estimates uh, that have not been calculated with me but by some colleagues working in Latin America uh, at the World Bank. Uh, and these are basically, this is what's called an elasticity. And I, I've been told that most of you are not economists. Uh, so let me sort of try to explain what this is. Basically, this, this, what this number says is, how much poverty reduction are you going to get for each percentage point of growth, of economic growth? So if it's minus, minus 1.62, what this means is one percentage point of economic growth would lead, on average, in Latin America to a decline in moderate poverty, in this case, of 1.62 percentage points. Sorry, percent. Um, 
So what I've done is take this number, which is really calculated for the region overall, and of course this number will change from country to country, you know, not all countries are equivalent, but just sort of as a suggestive exercise. And I've taken the countries that Nora looks at on the paper, uh, taken her numbers for poverty, and you know, we've already said these are limited, there are only limited data points and so on, and compare what we actually see, that's what's called actual, with what would be projected if you use this elasticity. So basically, what I'm saying is, given the economic growth that we have actually witnessed, what would we have projected in terms of poverty reduction? Uh, what you can see, and the white cells are basically years in which the actual, it's lower than the projected. So you actually see, if you want larger poverty declines than we would have expected given economic growth. I, I don't want to make a huge deal out of this, you know, this is sort of a back of the envelope exercise, but what I want to suggest is that it's sort of mixed. I mean, you don't see a clear pattern in terms of the actual always being below the projected. In the cases where it is, uh, the differences are in some cases big, in other cases not so big. So I think it is a little bit mixed in terms of leftist governments managing to get more you know, more traction out of economic growth than, you know, in this case alone. Let me get to the comparison later. The same applies to extreme poverty. Um, if you compare actual and projected, in most cases it's a mixed picture. In some years it, one is above, in some years another, you know, the other one is above. Um, so, you know, again, not a clear pattern that in the countries that are governed by the left, you do see systematically larger poverty declines um, once you control for the fact that they are growing in this, uh, during this period. Interestingly enough, when you look at other countries that are not governed by the left, the same picture arises. So what I'm trying to say here is that, again, with all the data caveats, I, I think taking into account that the, that the region overall is growing, it is a little bit more nuanced. I mean, it, there's not really a clear distinction between the sort of so-called leftist countries and the non-leftist countries, and le leftist countries having achieved sort of higher than expected poverty declines. Um, and again, these numbers are suggestive. Uh, by no means I want to uh, suggest that the predictions are actually sort of accurate um, scenarios that we should be taking uh, very seriously. How about if we look at the question uh, in the second way that I suggested, that is, if we could sort of, you know, rewind and put a right-wing government where we have left, uh, leftist governments and see what happens, and then we could compare those two scenarios, what would we find? Well, as you can imagine, that is not a very easy exercise to perform, and, you know, I'm by no means attempting to do this uh, here. Um, let me just sort of give you a few sort of anecdotal suggestions. Um, if you look at the growth record of countries governed by the left and countries governed by the right, uh, they don't seem to be particularly different in terms of con some countries growing faster than others. Um, you have a bit of both on both groups. Um, if you try to compare countries that have similar growth records, uh, for example, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay with maybe Mexico and Nicaragua, and, and in a way these comparisons are a little bit crazy, if you want, because you know institutions are different, social norms are different. These countries are different, even if they are growing at the same speed. But you know, for what it's worth, you really see comparable pictures in terms of poverty declines and inequality declines. So again, it doesn't seem that those countries that are governed by the left are doing particularly better once we start refining the comparisons uh, a little bit. Maybe a more meaningful question, you know, than trying to imagine this world where you have right governments instead of left governments is saying, well, what are actually these governments doing in terms of social policy, uh, and in particular in terms of pro-poor policies? And Nora and Santiago already alluded to this extensively. Uh, let me just sort of complement what they said, which I agree with primarily by saying that, uh, you know, what we know is there's been significant growth. This has translated in most countries into more revenue, uh, either because uh, there's been a structural reforms on the revenue side, which are the exception, or because there's been a commodity boom and an oil boom that basically has just generated more money that the government could then use. 
Some of this money has actually uh, been devoted to spending more on social spending. Uh, so in a way, Nora, what I understood is your data on public spending is all public spending. It wasn't social, yeah. So, so what I'm looking here, uh, what I'm looking at here is sort of a part, the part of public spending that you would expect to be focused on the poor, uh, or at least to some extent, to be more focused on the poor than public spending overall. I'm using uh, data uh, from ECLAD, uh, 07, and again, even though this is social spending, you have to keep in mind that not all of it is pro-poor. Pensions are not pro-poor. They are included in here, so take it with a pinch of salt. But when you look at this data and how it's been changing over time, so what you have here is levels of social spending in 2002-2003, same number for 2004, 2005, and this is in percentage uh, of GDP. Uh, and you have the countries that the paper looks at and other countries in the region. And in a way, what I take away from here is that neither the levels nor the changes in, in social spending seem to be related to, to the ideology of the government uh, in power in that country during these years, which I think relates to what Santiago was saying, that is, you know, different things are happening in different countries. You have similarities in terms of the tools that some countries are using, but then you have differences in terms of how they are financing that. So it's really hard to come up with a typology that maps perfectly into this division between left and right. Um, let me then go from there. You know, given this, I think what I take from the paper is that it is a really important question. I mean, this issue of policy and institutions versus growth, and you know how much each of those is impacting poverty. I think the evidence in the paper is a little bit mixed, and maybe some of the regression analysis that Nora was discussing will clarify some of these issues. But I think there's a broader question here uh, that needs to be addressed, and Santiago also spoke to this, that is, well, what's really behind what we've seen in the region over the last few years? We have seen poverty declines, and we have seen inequality declines. Uh, but when we sort of broaden you know, our lens and try to take in various factors, what seems to be the picture that arises? Um, sort of a simplifying framework. Um, if you think about poverty reduction and what may cause it, uh, you could think about it in the following way. Uh, you can have poverty reduction because you have increases in labor productivity. You could have it because you have increases in labor supply and you have more people working. You could have increases in non-labor income, and this would be your cash transfers, uh, but it could also be remittances, for example, coming from other countries. And you could have interaction between, interactions between these three factors that also give you uh, changes in poverty. Interestingly enough, the region has actually been growing for a while now. I mean, both in the 90s and then in the 2000s, most countries in the region have experienced uh, positive economic growth. However, poverty only started to decline, at least significantly, during the 2000s. Uh, so then the question arises as to, well, if there's not such a clear relationship between economic growth and poverty declines, then what is it that explains why we now start uh, observing these poverty declines? Um, a series of papers uh, done by various researchers in the region suggests that there's a combination of two factors. On the one hand, it seems that it's really not labor productivity. So whatever is happening in these countries, as Santiago was saying, is not that the quality of your labor has increased, that you have a more skilled set of workers, and that therefore they are managing to be more productive uh, and to earn more income through that higher productivity. That's not what's driving the story. Um, it seems to be that it's really, the action is really on the non-labor income side. Um, and let me just show you a table, which I think underscores what actually Santiago explained really well. What this table does, it's, it tries to explain changes in GDP per capita, and it looks at three factors, um, which I mentioned before. Change in labor income per worker, which indirectly tries to get to the issue of productivity, which is a lot harder to measure. Changes in workers in the population, that would be your labor supply measure, and changes in non-labor income per head. This includes both transfers and remittances. In, in a lot of countries, it is primarily the transfers, but in places like Mexico and other places, for example, in the Caribbean, where migration is important, remittances do play an important role. Uh, what you see here is that labor income, changes in labor income are negative in 11 countries in the region, and in some cases, the changes are quite considerable. In contrast, changes in non-labor income are, are positive in most countries. 
they are not of the magnitude of the negative changes, so in some cases they won't compensate for that, but they are a positive force that explains in part why we are observing these declines in poverty. What's behind this? I think to a large extent, as was already mentioned, is social policy. It's a new generation of social programs. It's conditional cash transfer programs and similar programs that have managed to increase incomes among the poor. Uh, this is, I think, by all means, a very positive development uh, uh, in the region has been to some extent, I think, independent of the ideology of the government and driven by other factors, uh, social pressures, uh, fiscal position, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I won't get into, into this issue, which not already mentioned. When you try to look at you know, what's the role that these factors have played vis-a-vis -vis other factors, it turns out that a large fraction of the poverty decline that we've observed is explained by this, as opposed to developments in the labor market or increases in employment or higher wages, which would all be desirable forces uh, to observe. So one last comment, uh, which again sort of links to some of the things that uh, both Nora and Santiago have said. Um, it seems that sorry, uh, non-labor income, uh, it's what I meant here. It's one of the main drivers behind what we've seen, not necessarily associated or stronger in leftist versus non-leftist countries. There's still a lot of heterogeneity across countries, something that already uh, Santiago mentioned. For example, if you look at Brazil, most of the poverty and inequality improvements can actually be explained by what's happening on social programs. Chile is a little bit more mixed, but labor markets play a slightly more important role, uh, especially improvements in the quality of employment and access to employment among poor workers. And Mexico, it's a mix of everything. I mean, it's what's happening with social policies, what's happening in social, uh, sorry, in labor markets, and it's also what's happening with remittances. So once we look into specific countries, of course, a more nuanced picture arises. That's, that's why it's so hard to come up with these more general statements. Um, and I just want to close again with a comment on sustainability, which is something that both Nora and Santiago alluded to. Um, sustainability of the efforts that are being made on the social policy side uh, in terms of financing of these programs moving forward, but also sustainability in terms of how much more impact are these programs going to produce. And, and I think we are truly, I agree with Santiago on that, we are truly reaching a limit in terms of how much more mileage we can get out of CCTs and the like. Uh, and also, um, in the context of the current crisis, and I think this is something that Santiago mentioned, but I want to sort of allude to that again, I think a lot of the impact that we are going to see from this crisis is going to at least initially uh, fall on people that will not be captured by existing safety nets. Uh, a lot of the impact, it's being felt in urban areas first, among sort of lower middle class uh, households. These are not the beneficiaries of the oportunidades or the bolsa familia, et cetera. So not only will we see increases in poverty, but this may be uh, a different set of households altogether. So you know, some adjustments are gonna have to happen in terms of the safety nets in order to palliate some of these improved, some of these changes. But I think more worrisome, um, we need to ask ourselves how sustainable are these trends if they are not translating into increases in labor productivity, and what that means is that they are not translating into higher real wages uh, and better employment opportunities, uh, because there's only so much you're gonna be able to expand the social programs to increase coverage and to increase transfers. Um, this is really not a viable long-term growth strategy. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, and we can pick some of these issues up in the discussion. Thank you. Well, we've had um, three marvelous presentations, um, not necessarily in agreement one with the other. I'd love to give Nora 10 minutes of rebuttal, but I would prefer instead um, right now to turn to your questions and comments. Um, please identify yourself by name and by institution uh, and wait for the microphone um, so that it can be captured on our uh, on our website, let's uh, on the on the uh, webcast. Um, let's start back here, and then we'll go to this gentleman in front. Hi, um, my name is Claire Silke. I work at Congressional Research Service. I had a quick question. So you haven't seen any different results in, in the two programs that are so similar in Mexico, which was 
a non-left country and Brazil. I was just wondering if anyone's done a comparative study on the impacts of the two programs and then looked at what the governments have done as complementary policies. Like, could that be a difference between the left and the right, like the policies they put in place along with the cash transfers? And have you seen, for example, um, the Lula government being any more um, if it's the same program that started under Cardoso, how is it more left? Is it the complementary policies that you know the PT is putting forward? And the other quick question would be, um, if what you all are saying in the rebuttal is true, then could it even be that rightist countries that are more into free trade and trade capacity building and that kind of thing, that are into you know pr building productivity, plugging into the global economy, that kind of um, maybe right um, sort of policies? going along with these conditional cash transfers, is that a, I, I just thought it was interesting because that might be a right wing thing to do, uh, trade capacity building, uh, th that plugging into a free trade agreement, that sort of thing, along with cash transfers, which might be sort of a left. So I, I think the policy instrument question is interesting the way you've, you've raised it. Okay, let's take another question and then we'll switch over to the back. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Tomas Rosada, I'm from IDB. Um, I have two questions. Uh, Santiago, you proposed uh, basically uh, the need to have a new generation of reforms in terms of social policy, which I think is, is pretty much where we are moving towards. Um, now, what's your reading in terms of uh, security needs and the call for security in countries where, for example, I take the case of Central America, where we've had quite significant events in the past two months in Guatemala and Honduras, where population might be willing to put on the side social policy reforms for a call for security. So do you think there is a risk for postponing this uh, discussion because of security? Second, social programs um, don't seem to be quite a large portion of GDP, uh, at least CCT programs. Do you think it, or do you all think uh, is it really an argument to call for the f potential fiscal deterioration for a uh, recall of those programs or uh, sl lower uh, pace in their expansion? Um, or are we really talking of uh, something that could be sustained even in bad times? Okay, let's take one more question and then we'll return to our panelists, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Hello. I think yes. that's on. Thank you very much. Carlos Echeverria from the Organization of American States. It seems to me that uh, besides the link with democracy taking over, there seems, to me a, uh, there seems to be a link with the Washington consensus diminishing import in importance. Uh, it seems to me, too, that some of the conditions now are similar to the conditions when Dr. Prebish started with the so-called CLAC model of development uh, in relation to the link with uh, exports of commodities um, and uh, remittances uh, coming too. Uh, are we ready or is there a chance uh, now uh, for a new model of development? Is a new model uh, cooking? Okay, let's return to our panelists. Uh, Nora, do you want to start? Santiago, Carolina, I have no particular preference. Jump in. Uh, yeah, I, let's see. Uh, I think that in terms of the CCTs specifically, I don't think you're going to see that much of a difference. By the way, people are speaking about right and left. I think you have a lot of countries that may be placed in the center. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, we, we have to remember that as well when we do the political analysis. And uh, I think we have very, very few really, truly right-wing uh, governments now in, in the region. However, I don't think that the issue is uh, that Brazil and Mexico are doing differently in CCTs. I mean, uh, uh, which by the way, is, it is a sort of an unfortunate name because it has the conditions uh, uh, attached to it. When, we, when I was at the IDB, we used to call them targeted human development programs, which gives it a nicer ring. And I propose that we begin to change it <laughs> because the conditionality always gives shivers to everybody. Uh, 
So uh, in any event, I don't think that that is the difference. Uh, I think, and maybe, uh, I don't know whether Cardoso didn't expand. I mean, what, what you do see under Lula is the number of beneficiaries expanded big time. Uh, so that's, I don't know why Cardoso was timid with it. And maybe, you know, is this left, right? You were with Lula and spoke about this, so you, maybe you can give us the inside information of what, how did he decided to go big time with the, with the CCT. Uh, I wanted just to, you know, if I may, uh, the trade element, I don't think, you know, there's that much difference because all the governments are still, op I mean, all the countries are still fairly open. I mean, they're introducing some protective barriers, but they're still within the uh, commitments that they made under GATT and whatever, and they're, they're, you know, more or less, they're observing their regional commitments in terms of openness. So I don't think that would distinguish them uh, between, between them. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment regarding both Santiago's and uh, Carolina's point about well, what, what can we, can we actually isolate what happened in terms of growth from what we observe? And is this too short of a period? We can try to isolate with econometrics. And the econometrics, if you look at the terms of trade effect, you find in the table that you will see in the PowerPoint, that for the social democratic regimes, the effect is preserved. So there seems to be something there that is different. Uh, the coefficient continues to be significant. We've tried different specifications, et cetera. It disappears for the populace. So for the populace, it seems that growth is doing all the work, and it's based maybe in unsustainable expansionary fiscal deficits, like you said, using the, uh, the windfall from the terms of trade and borrowing from the future. No? Uh, but in the, in, the, in the social democratic regimes, that doesn't seem to be the case. So that's interesting in itself, and I think it's worth pursuing. I wouldn't give it up because it's so short a period. I think it is interesting, and it also, you know, quite frankly, probably serves, uh, it's consistent with a lot of things that we like about the combination of progressive social policy, participatory democracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and pro, pro good incentives, okay? So I, I, I would submit that we need to continue there. And regarding Tomas's question about security versus social policy, I have no idea what, uh, but I mean, I'm going to let Santiago <laughs> answer that question. I think that maybe they're not so different. Maybe, you know, good social policy might help make more uh, sort of a peaceful coexistence in the countries, but, uh, but that, that's a very, very difficult question. I think that CCTs can be maintained through the austerity programs because they are such a small portion of government spending. It would be utterly stupid to cut them. This utterly stupidity was committed in the past, by the way. In the, you know, in the 1980s, a lot of the adjustment programs cut very small poverty programs in terms of the spending because nobody paid attention to it. Well, let's, I'm, I'm sure this is not going to happen again. So I, I, I think there will be. But like Santiago said, the problem in the region is that it doesn't have the social protection instruments to deal with the cost of the crisis or last year with the cost of the rising food prices. That's where we're going to see a lot of, a lot of uh, increase, increases in poverty with the crisis. So uh, no, let me finish. Let me, let me stop now. I can put this. I don't know. Yeah, this is on. Um, maybe just following up a little bit on Nora's comment on sort of the fiscal constraints moving forward and CCTs versus the broader sort of policy package uh, that targets the poor directly or indirectly. I, I share Nora's view. I don't think it's CCTs per se that are in danger of disappearing. Certain reforms uh, may be postponed. Uh, there's been talk in certain countries of expanding these programs to urban areas uh, to directly tackle some of the uh, most visible impacts of the crisis. Uh, and in some places, fiscal constraints may play a role in, in terms of the timing of those reforms. But I think the programs themselves will, will continue to exist. I think where the, where the fiscal constraint issue comes in is if you start thinking about sort of broader policy packages that will impact both growth and the, pol and the poverty impact that that growth has. Um, and what we are seeing in a lot of countries is, for example, um, decisions about investments uh, being postponed uh, or being changed. And some of these investments 
are targeting poor areas. And what I mean here is investments in infrastructure, um, be it you know building roads that connect remote rural areas, be it building new schools, and you know when when you're sort of running out of cash, these are the things that somehow can be put in the back burner, but that will no doubt sort of impact your growth path in the future, and to some extent, how much poverty reduction you'll be able to achieve, because a lot of these things, even if not targeted directly to specific poor households, would impact, as we were commenting before, their labor productivity, their capacity to access employment, and so on. So I think, you know, when we talk about the fiscal constraints, it is a slightly broader set of policies that may be affected over the next few years. Um, and, and, and sort of a related point, because we do expect the crisis to impact the specific groups that have not been considered particularly vulnerable over the last few years, um, but that at the same time, I'm sort of trying to link it a little bit to the political economy kind of issue, because these are groups that tend to have more voice than your sort of average rural poor household. Um, and we're talking sort of low middle class urban households uh, that, you know, can demonstrate and uh, vote and so on. Uh, there may be a little bit of pressure and uh, sort of tension over available resources in terms of where you put your money and who you assist first. And then the discussion is how you do that so that you don't compromise sort of ongoing medium term efforts that were more targeted to the existing or chronic poor, if you want. So, so just a, a short comment on the comparison of, of Mexico, Brazil. I think the mislabeled CCTs, because I agree with Nora's uh, uh, name better, should be judged in terms of what the objective of those programs were. And, and the objective of those programs was to invest in the human capital of the poor. So the problem is that in some countries we have more data than others to judge the impact of those programs, not in the dimension of what they did to income poverty, but in the dimension of what they did to health outcomes and educational outcomes and nutritional outcomes. The broad evidence is that, by and large, there have been positive impacts on, on, on these dimensions. The data for Brazil is more scarce than the data for other countries, so statements about the impact of Bolsa Familia on health and education and nutrition is not that it didn't have it, it's just that the data to, to make sufficient uh, statements about that is not there. In, in, in Mexico, there's more data along those dimensions, and, and the impact has been positive. I, I really think that that's what those, con those programs are doing. And the impact of those programs on income poverty and on income distribution is a welcome byproduct, but a byproduct. What, what they need to do is to invest in people. That, that's what those programs should be doing. Um, and secondly, on the, and I close here, on the, on the fiscal dimension, I, I, I agree with both um, Nora and Carolina. Look, CCTs are a very small share of total spending and even a very small share of total social spending. So when you're cutting the budget by one, one and a half percent of, of, of GDP to preserve a program that covers 20 percent of the population and only costs half a percent of GDP is really not that difficult. So what we have now is a huge amount of learning that the pain inflicted and the cost to society of cutting those programs is very, very high. So hopefully in this particular crisis, that will not occur. And the indication so far is that in fact, if anything, countries are strengthening those programs, in my view wrongly, but, but they're not, not, not cutting them. Okay, um, I think we have time for one last question. I see Mark uh, Schneider, well, I'll, t I'll take two. I'll take this and this. We'll try to be very brief. We have uh, another meeting coming in here, so we have to clear out. So we'll ask people to be very concise. Mark Schneider. I'll try to make it very quickly. Um, I was interested, obviously the presentations were excellent and the comments as well. Um, I was interested that there is not a lot of discussion about the distinction, for example, Santiago mentioned return of democracy, take Chile. You have a substantial decline in poverty over the course of the 90s, and you only have the reduction in inequality in the last couple of years. And I was just wondering about the distinction in policies that might explain that. In the second, Santiago, you talked about the, the question about sustainability. Um, and particularly since you're not, you haven't had any evidence of going after the top of the income uh, scale. 
uh, is it more likely that you'll see the um, the populist countries being will, willing to take on really progressive tax uh, policies uh, over the next couple of years? They have done it already. Okay, and then this gentleman here, again, very brief. Thank you. I'm Vito Tanzi. I was a former director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the Fund. And uh, I want to follow, in fact, in the last question, I was somewhat surprised that uh, the whole discussion never mentioned taxes. You know, and if you are in a situation where a very large share of the total income of the country goes to the top 5% or 10% of the population, you really cannot get away from talking about taxes. You know, proportional taxes will not do. So I, I remember, you know, there, there is a reluctance in Latin America to, to tax personal income, you know. I remember discussion with the Minister of Finance of Mexico a couple of years ago where I, I, he was trying to convince me that uh, lowering the marginal tax rate from 28% to 22% was a rational policy. And I was saying this is crazy in you know, OECD countries. You know, I remember in, in Peru being in, in a television program where the interviewer was trying to convince me that the marginal tax rate was destroying the countries. And I was pointing out that only one for 88,000 Peruvian was subject to the marginal tax rate, which was very low to start with. So I don't see, I think that, I, I was fascinated by the presentation, but I would suggest that next time you put the, the tax element in the picture. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's have Santiago and Carolina give Nora the last word. I'd like to remind people that there are extra copies of Nora's paper that are on the outside table if you didn't have a chance to grab one on your way in. I'd like to thank Adam Stovitz, the uh, program associate with the Latin American program, as well as Camilo Zambrano from, um, from American University for their help this morning. Is Heather here? Heather Haynes from, from uh, Center for Global Development. Thank you to our colleagues there. Uh, and to Nikki Nichols, who's not with us today from the Latin American program. Uh, Santiago. No, to, to just a quick comment, because I know we're pressed for time. Uh, surely taxes is the elephant in the middle of the living room. Um, and lurking behind all this discussion of fiscal sustainability is a question whether all this was accompanied by redistribution from the high income to low income, i.e. taxes, or it was not accompanied by that, but it was being financed by commodity prices and some transitory boom. So, so yeah, and, and, and then taxes on high-income households. And estate. Hmm. You, know, estate you can think of income taxes, state taxes, but taxes on high-income households and whether that's the redistribution that is going on. So implicit in the discussion was that, but I mean, just it is clearly, and, and that's where I left the question, has this occurred? And, and, and the answer, you gave it before. I don't have any. Carolina, yeah, I Nora. Have a I don't know exactly why, why, what programs have made inequality, if there are programs that have made inequality fall in Chile. Uh, the, what you do see, and you know, I just wanted to emphasize that, but no, we didn't go into this, is this, this reduction in labor income inequality because of the decline in the wage gap. And that in Chile was very important. That is unrelated to transfers, and it's more related to investment in education and what happened in the labor markets. And the fact that in most of these countries, the skill bias technical change from trade opening took place in the 90s, that you have an equalizing effect, and that's been dwindling now because it's a once and for all effect. So you have something happening in the labor market, and in Chile that seems to be predominant. But uh, there still would be interesting to see whether that's the only factor or are there policies that are different in Chile under Lagos from previously. Taxes, taxes are fundamental, but the survey, some of them have taxes, some don't have taxes, and so we, we you know, the, the whole discussion was not really looking into that because I don't think you're going to be able to really tackle that problem until we reveal the information. And Vito, I would ask you to, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to start a movement, actually, to get the information on taxing at the top because that information is not released. And let me tell you, there is a very serious group of researchers that has been working on this. Tony Atkinson in Oxford, Piketty in Paris, Saez Emmanuel in uh, Berkeley, that have been working for all the countries that have the data. We don't want the names, we just want the information. Let me tell you the story about Mexico. They try to get the information from Mexico for a student that was doing a PhD at Berkeley. They said no. Uh, then they went to the Transparency Commission, and the Transparency Commission said no. 
So you know, we are we have a long way to go. I think they don't want to reveal that information because it's going to show that the rich are not being taxed. Mm -hmm. And it's going to show that the tax evasion is huge. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to show that to, the, to, the, to their citizens. But if we want to make progress on that front, we first need that information. Because unless you have that, you're not going to get the political movement that you need for people to go in the direction that you're proposing to the countries. Okay. Thank you all for your good questions, for these wonderful presentations. I think clearly this is an issue that uh, um, is ripe for ongoing um, um, research and debate. Um, thank you very much for joining us.